I am an American. And as a citizen of the United States of America, I feel enormously privileged to be an integral part of the greatest, most prosperous, and most powerful nation in the world. But I have a story to tell that goes back very, very far away, about 5,500 miles away, going back about 100 years ago. And that's because I am the grandson of political refugees. My grandparents lived in a small village on the Black Sea coast of what is today northeastern Turkey in the Pontic Mountains region. 3,000 years of Greek civilization in that part of Europe. But in the aftermath of World War I, high-stakes diplomacy led to the cleansing, the mutual cleansing, of religious minorities between Greece and Turkey. About 750,000 Turkish Muslims were forcibly removed from their homes and resettled in Turkey, and about a million and a half Greek Orthodox Christians were forcibly removed from their homes and resettled in Greece. My grandparents were expelled from their homes with almost nothing on their backs. They resettled in a poor farming village in northern Greece, and there they endured over the next several decades the Great Depression, the Second World War, Nazi occupation, and the Communist Civil War that was absolutely brutal on the population of the country. So that by the end of the 1940s, one out of every 10 Greeks had died as a result of these tragedies. My family did what they could to save whatever money was available in order to be able to buy my father a ticket on a boat. And my grandfather pulled him over one day and said, son, go to America. That is where you will find hope and opportunity and to be able to build a better and more beautiful life for yourself and for your family. My father met my mother several years later. They married and they settled in Jersey City, back when it was still a working class town. My mother raised my brother and me in a small brownstone apartment on Grove and 7th Street, for those of you who remember Jersey City. And uh, it's a beautiful neighborhood. It's changed a bit over the last several decades. But my parents were working parents. My father worked at a bakery in Lower Manhattan. It's still there, as a matter of fact. Worked very, very difficult hours. Those of you who know baker's hours. As an immigrant, he worked sometimes two or three extra jobs as he needed to in order to be able to one day save enough money and buy us a home of our own. My father and my mother went through tremendous challenges in those early years in the United States. They barely spoke the language. My father was here with $27 in his pocket. They worked very, very hard. But they knew that they had an opportunity to build a new and better life in America that simply wouldn't be available to them back in a country ravaged by war and destitution. And so my father would always say to my brother and me as we were growing up, beautiful words, simple yet so wise, he would say to us, America, great country, great, great country. And so my mother and father were so proud the day that they became United States citizens, an enormous achievement in their lives. And I'm very proud to be able to tell not only everyone in my family as a reminder, but friends and colleagues whom I encounter. I'm the first member of my entire family, my entire bloodline for that matter, to be born in the United States of America. And I consider it a great personal honor and privilege. So we have this great, great feeling of pride and of gratitude being in America, going back to the hardship of my grandparents, the difficulties my parents faced, and yet they were able to make a very good living and lead a comfortable and safe and wonderful life here in America. So they would often take, often take us on summer holidays to Greece. And when we arrived in the village, the kids would gather, seeing us coming out of the taxi, and point to us and say in Greek, Irthanta Americanakia, the young Americans have arrived. 
Now, my brother and I thought that was pretty cool. We were very proud of that. Although, as I've come to learn the politics of the region, I wonder sometimes if they didn't really mean it in a very good way. But in a personal capacity, I think about that America that so inspired my parents and millions of men and women around the world to leave behind families and kinships and close ties to come to this distant and sometimes strange land for so many people. And in a professional capacity, I think, how do we better engage citizens and organizations and governments around the world? How do we signal to the world who we are as Americans and as a government and as a nation? So how do we most effectively engage our fellow men and women worldwide? I'm somewhat concerned that today we're trapped in a debate between nativism and globalism. There are those who feel that American culture and the American nation has lost too much in recent years, in recent decades, to external encroachments. Too many people here who haven't fully assimilated, they're very concerned about what is happening to the country that they grew up in. On the other hand, you have a more cosmopolitan sense that all of humanity is essentially the same. We're all bound by a single common thread, and there really are no serious distinctions, politically, culturally, or otherwise. I'm not so sure the lines have to be drawn either way. Every government around the world has an obligation to protect its citizens and to protect its territory from across its borders. But every government has an equal duty to provide the environment for its citizens to flourish economically, culturally, and in other fulfilling and enriching ways. And so it's very important for the United States to be able to telegraph that shared interest that we have with so many of our allies and partners around the world because it's in our own national interest and for the well-being of our own citizens. So take, for instance, the consumer lifestyle that we enjoy here in America today. Unimaginable, 30, 40, 50 years ago, John D. Rockefeller, 100 years ago, didn't live the way a working American does today. But so much of that lifestyle that we enjoy in America depends on global commerce. And so we need safe shipping lanes to be able to get goods from other countries here to the United States and to get goods that are manufactured here in the United States to other markets. Who is going to protect these shipping lanes from what has been the historical phenomenon of piracy or the more modern phenomenon of terrorism? It's the United States. It's our armed forces that protect shipping lanes, not only to our benefit, but to those of our allies and partners, and ironically, even our adversaries who get to use the same shipping lanes protected by the United States to propel their economies forward. By the same token, I would say, it is incumbent upon governments to negotiate trade agreements to facilitate that global commerce and sustain our economies in ways that not only advance commercial interests, but also the well-being of working Americans. Absolutely critical. To do so, we need to be engaged at all times with so many countries around the world, allies and partners first and foremost, and those countries that seek to come into this larger orbit of prosperity and security with America. And that's really been the driving force for the way we've conducted our policies around the world for the last 70 years or so. But things are changing very rapidly, the last 10 years. And I want to take a look at just the countries uh, involving my own family for a moment and then break out into some of the larger concerns that we have. In Greece, we had a once prosperous, vibrant country in the heart of Europe that has undergone not a financial recession, but a depression over the last eight years that has utterly flattened its middle class. It's gotten so difficult there that the White House two years ago was very much concerned 
that a country inside the European Union and the NATO alliance was on the verge of becoming a failed state. And across the Aegean Sea, we have a government in Turkey that is becoming increasingly authoritarian, suppressing media criticism and any type of popular dissent, becoming a less reliable ally in a more dangerous part of the world. And that dangerous part of the world is just a few hundred miles south of these countries. So what are we dealing with with some of the major challenges that we read about in the papers every day? In Libya, we have an ungoverned battleground between weak political leaders and determined terrorists. In Egypt, we have a country utterly torn between military dictatorship and religious fanaticism. Islamic State is erasing political borders in Syria and Iraq and exporting terrorism to other Middle Eastern countries, to Europe, and unfortunately even to the United States. Russia continues to occupy eastern Ukraine and Crimea. And Iran? Iran continues to be the world's leading state sponsor of international terrorism. It is developing a dangerous nuclear weapons program, and it is helping North Korea develop a ballistic missile program that the North Korean regime would like to be able to strike the United States with in three to five years. So we have very serious challenges around the world. And we all know about the atrocities in Syria. Syria is not a case of a civil war. Syria is a matter of many small civil wars between so many confusing and complex factions inside the country. But what is most horrific is what is happening on a human scale. Hundreds of thousands of people have been killed in the last six years in Syria. Millions of Syrians have been displaced from their homes, streaming as migrants and as refugees into Middle Eastern countries and into distant European lands. In Syria, we have a humanitarian crisis that is a shock to the conscience. And yet, the United States, concerned as we are about security and stability, cares deeply about the well-being of other people. It doesn't always play out very well. We need to be honest about this. And remember that 20 years ago or so, the United States decided to not intervene to prevent the genocide in Rwanda. But essentially, we are a good and giving nation that seeks to help out wherever we're able to do so. And it's a special gift that the United States has above practically any other country in the world. When there is calamity anywhere in the world, even our most persistent critics know that it's America that would be called upon to help resolve the crisis, to deal with the emergency, and to deliver assistance and relief to people in all corners of the globe. The reason we're able to do this is because we alone have the wealth to provide the resources, the military capacity to deliver the resources around the world, but most importantly, I would say, it's that we have earned the trust of most countries around the world to do fundamentally good things. And the way that we do this is through our partnerships, strengthening bonds with allies and partners around the world, sharing the benefits that we enjoy as the dominant power in the world, but sharing those benefits with so many countries and encouraging as many other countries outside of that orbit to come in and join this umbrella of security and of prosperity. Ladies and gentlemen, Peace is not the norm in human history. It's one of the great tragedies of humanity. War is the norm. Peace is very precious, and it has to be protected and defended at all times. And this was the American vision in the aftermath of World War II, with the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan and the NATO Alliance that protected and defended all of Europe, most of Europe, not Eastern Europe, unfortunately. But that protection included the small, poor, ravaged nation of Greece. 
And it's a grand vision today that I think is so important as we enter more deeply this young century, this 21st century, and think about who we are as Americans and what our nation represents to the world. In my grand vision, American policy weaves together the physical security of our nation, stronger bonds with allies and partners around the world, and with countries that aspire to join us, and working with our allies with effective and persuasive diplomacy, armed diplomacy, to keep our adversaries at bay. This is how we better protect America. This is how we better maintain a system of order that allows us to lead very, very privileged lives here in America and in those countries that call themselves our allies and partners. I wonder sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, if my grandparents, forcibly expelled from their homes a hundred years ago, ever imagined that their family would wind up in America. I wonder sometimes if they ever imagined that the first American grandson in the family would be privileged to enjoy a career where he meets with U.S. presidents and senators and members of Congress, multinational CEOs and other world leaders in the grandest centers of power. I even wonder sometimes if they imagined that that first American grandson would stand on a stage such as this, in this magnificent Paramount Theater, to be able to publicly express my gratitude to my parents and to my grandparents for their enormous sacrifices on behalf of my brother and me. And also to be able to express my very humble gratitude to the countless Americans who've made the greatest sacrifice, most of them strangers, of past and current generations, so that I, all of you, and all of our fellow Americans can live a life privileged and fortunate as American citizens. And so, my improbable but very American story that began a hundred years ago in the ashes of the Ottoman Empire and passed through the tragedies and milestones of the 20th century and brings me here to this beautiful city of Asbury Park, New Jersey, doesn't give us pause for celebration, for remembrance, and for enormous and profound gratitude as Americans. I hear in my ears the voice of my father from a place of beautiful and refreshing repose where he is now, saying in my ear, John, this is America, a great, great country. Thank you very much. Thank you.